Okay, let's get started. Okay, as I mentioned yesterday, we're going to wrap up on memory interference and quality of service today, and then we're going to hopefully cover emerging memory technologies. And next week, we're going to do GPU programming, more GPUs, and then you're going to have a guest lecture uh, from Stefan Meyer at Apple. If you weren't here yesterday, it's not going to be recorded, and you're going to be responsible for it on the exam. Anything, you can guess that there will be pre-patching questions since it's such an important topic, right? Besides, come prepared with questions that you may want to ask for someone who uh, has a lot of experience on designing real prefetchers in industry. Okay, so this is what we discussed last time, fairness via source throttling. Uh, this was one of the slides that we covered, ups and downs. I'll go over this quickly again, just to jog your memory. Remember, source throttling throttles the sources uh, to so that uh, you inject less into shared resources and you reduce interference that way. Uh, and conceptually it's easy to implement because there's no need to change the memory scheduling algorithm, for example. There's no need to change the resources that are shared. But this is conceptual. As we mentioned yesterday, the devil is in the details and the details are a lot. Uh, and this can be a general way of handling shared resource contention because you're really managing, uh, managing interference at the sources, not at the resources. And Meaning that you can manage the interference at all of the shared resources. As long as the sources are at the boundary of injection, then you don't need to put any techniques inside. So it's very powerful in that sense. And also, uh, this is a unique uh, benefit that it has over prioritization or data mapping. It can essentially reduce the overall load and contention in the system. And if you remember, I, I drew the load latency curve, which we're going to see later on also. It can basically get the system to a point where the latencies are lower by reducing the load on the system. Of course, it has disadvantages too. Uh, at least the, the mechanism we examined requires some slowdown estimations, uh, which are difficult to estimate. If you're using some other techniques, you still need some mechanism to understand what kind of interference is happening inside the shared resources, which means you still need to put stuff in your shared resources to detect that. And as I mentioned, threshold can become difficult to optimize, and there are many, 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 many thresholds in this sort of techniques in general. Uh, and uh, if you're not careful with the thresholds, you may lose throughput significantly because you overthrottle uh, some sources. Basically, overall, it can be difficult to find an overall good configuration. And as we also mentioned, potentially machine learning techniques here can help, although I have not seen any works uh, that use machine learning uh, in this direction. Okay, so I will not belabor this more, but uh, you can read some papers. And as I, uh, since it's a general technique, it's not just in memory systems, it's employed in interconnects, for example, which we will see later on. And it's employed in internet also, as we discussed in various forms. Okay, any questions on source throttling? Cool. Now let's look at the last major one. And uh, I'll, I'll briefly go over uh, some recent work in this area, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail uh, to show, uh, but I would like to show, the show you the overall generality of this technique also. Basically, the idea is application or threat scheduling. Uh, you, you have control uh, over that as well. Uh, and the key idea is very simple, basically. You pick threads that do not badly interfere with each other to be scheduled together on cores that share the main memory system, right, or memory system. That way you can decide uh, at the threat scheduling point uh, how bad the interference will be. Okay, And there could be uh, many examples of this. For example, you decide uh, one, uh, both applications are not very intensive, and you basically put both applications on the same multi-core system. And then they will not interfere with each other, hopefully, right, if they're not intensive. Of course, you've got to be careful. If for this to work nicely, you need to have a good mixture of threads. Right? If you don't have any choice, for example, if you have only two threads and two cores, Clearly, you, you cannot use this technique. For this to be effective, you need to have more threads to schedule than the number of uh, hardware thread contacts that you have. OK, so let me cover uh, something that's, that looks at multiple aspects of this, actually. It includes partitioning as well, but also thread scheduling. And this is some work that we've done uh, with Intel some time ago, looking at uh, more distributed systems, on-chip networks. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go over it. I'll, I'll, I'll look at the key ideas in a little bit. 
basically, uh, if you look at multi-core systems, you have multiple cores, and people are very more interested in many core systems these days, having many, many cores. If you remember uh, the first lecture, we talked about the Cerebras wafer scale engine. It actually had 400,000 cores according to that, right? So this is already happening, as you can see. Right? There was a, there's a point in time when people were thinking, who cares, who wants all of these cores, right? But now I think people are not questioning that as much. If, if the application is able to take advantage of those cores, then you do want those cores. And with today, with machine learning especially, the application has been there. But maybe 10 years ago, that was not the case. People were not thinking uh, as confidently about these many core systems. OK, so what happens in many core systems? So imagine a many core system where you have uh, multi the cores laid out like this. And you have memory controllers on the side, because you cannot have hundreds of memory controllers, because you're limited by the channels that you have off chip. You need to place your memory controllers somewhere. Assuming that you place your memory controllers this way, now this core, when it accesses memory, it needs to access a memory controller, right? But before that, uh, usually these systems also distribute the caches. Basically, you have a shared cache, let's say, and uh, you partition the cache across many of these cores. So a slice of this cache is here, another slice is here, another slice is here, and your data map may be cached in any of those locations because potentially, because of the way you map, you did the mapping, or maybe this particular core needed that data over here. So uh, basically, if you have a system like this, you actually have, you, you can actually generate a lot of on-chip communication. For example, this core needs to access the data that is present in this particular cache slice. It essentially needs to get access to that cache slice somehow. And usually you use some sort of interconnect. We're going to talk about interconnects more, but one form of interconnect is a two-dimensional mesh interconnect, which kind of looks like this essentially. You're basically connected to your immediate neighbors, up, down, left, and right. And then if you want to access uh, data in, in some location that's over here, that's in this node over here, you need to get your message routed to that node. And you usually use some routing mechanism. It's like a network, basically. It's an on-chip network in the end. How many of you have taken a networks course? OK, right now. But you know about networks, internet, probably. This is essentially a distributed system, if you think about it. Right? You're, you have cores that are distributed across the chip. And you have data that's also distributed across the chip, and you want to access some piece of data that's residing in some other location of the chip. And you essentially have routers in each of these nodes, and you route the, you, uh, you route the message that you want uh, so that you can get the data that you want. So this is one communication. If, you, if, the, if the data is actually present in the cache, then it's nice, and the data gets back routed to, uh, to the core that requested it. So there needs to be some protocol to guarantee it. And that's the routing protocol, which we will talk about when we get to interconnects. But you can see that this causes uh, communication on, on chips. So if many cores are communicating with many different parts, you cause a lot of congestion on the network, potentially. OK, this becomes worse if you get a cache miss, right? If you get a cache miss, it's not animated very well. But you first need to check the cache. So you route a message. You send a message to this cache. The cache says, I don't have that data. And then the cache sends a message to the memory controller where the data is supposed to be. And the memory controller essentially accesses memory and returns the data back to the cache. And then the cache returns the data back to the core that requested the data. Make sense? Clearly, uh, how much communication happens is affected by how your data is mapped. For example, you may map uh, the data arbitrarily to memory controllers on a cache block granularity. Cache block 0 may be here, 1 may be here, 2 may be here, 3 may be here, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's cache block interleaving. Consecutive cache blocks are in consecutive memory controllers. That may or may not be a good idea, right? That may cause a lot of interference in the system because now if a core is accessing uh, consecutive cache blocks, it needs to send, assuming that it's not in the cache, let's say, uh, it needs to send a request to this memory controller first, this memory controller next, this memory controller next, this memory controller next. So it's a streaming core, basically, round robins, it's accessed across many memory controllers. And that could cause a lot of contention if all cores are streaming, for example. Right? So how your data is mapped is clearly important in such a system. How your applications are mapped is also, uh, is also important, as we will see. Uh, we didn't talk about distributed caches, but distributed caches have the, essentially the same problem as well. Where do you, where you have an address, which cache bank should you check to check if that address is cached uh, on a distributed uh, on the distributed cache on chip. Right. 
this is this is really determined your data mapping mechanism. Where is an address mapped uh, on these cache banks? Right? And one way of doing the address mapping is very similar. You can do cache block interleaving, right? Cache block zero is here, one is here, two is here, three is here, four is here, dot dot dot. Basically, consecutive cache blocks are in consecutive nodes in the network. So this is a static mapping. The address is statically mapped to a particular cache bank. Again, that may or may not be a good thing. Right? Or you could, you, could, you could have coarse grain mapping. You could say consecutive rows are mapped into consecutive caches. Depends on how, which bits you select. And as I mentioned yesterday, mapping is not an easy problem. And this makes it even harder, as you can see. Right? You have multiple types of mapping. Where does the cache block get mapped to in terms of memory controllers? Where does the cache block get, get mapped to in terms of the distributed cache banks? And the choices you make over here critically affect the contention that you get in these shared resources on the network, on the shared caches, as well as shared memory controllers, as well as shared interconnect. Does that make sense? And there's been a lot of work in terms of how should you map the map, uh, addresses and how should you map the data, how should you map the applications. This work kind of bridges a lot of things together. But again, these are all heuristics. What I'm going to describe is all heuristics again. It's, uh, these are some, uh, somewhat hard to optimize. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, an example interference. You have an application that's light, and you have an application that's heavy. Light means it's not accessing memory a lot. Heavy means it's accessing memory a lot. Now, if you actually uh, map data, uh, let's say, uh, randomly, or you interleave cache blocks uh, across, uh, 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 across memory controls, uh, across cache banks, the light application may actually suffer, right? Because what happens is light application only once in a while requests blocks from a cache or a memory controller. And then it needs to do this access, let's say. But the heavy application is generating a lot of accesses across the entire network. So in the end, the net result is that the light application gets delayed significantly. So we have a very similar problem as we've seen in the memory controllers, except it's exacerbated right now because the delays are not happening just here, or just here, or just here, anywhere. It's really happening across the entire distributed system that we have. So then the key question is actually, how do you handle this sort of interference? And this is just one example, right? You may have one light application over here and maybe 20 heavy applications over here. So you've got to be careful in terms of how you map the application as well as data. So uh, we looked at this from the perspective of spatial task scheduling. So you have actually a bunch of applications. They may have different characteristics, as you've seen yesterday. And how do you map these applications to these different cores? And there are many considerations over here, clearly. Uh, there are many challenges that you need to take into account, especially if you have a network system like this, how do you reduce the communication distance between an application and the data that it requests? Uh, how do you reduce the destructive interference between applications? These are different questions, right? This reduces latency, clearly. If you do a good job over here, you reduce the latency of access, regardless of interference. The second one is, if you have interference, how do you reduce the destruct destructive interference between applications, a light one and a heavy one, for example? And of course, uh, you want to improve the throughput as well. How do you prioritize the applications to improve throughput? So a lot of the, sim the similar principles that we discussed yesterday actually apply, or yesterday and the previous day, uh, previous week, actually apply over here also. But the problem is even more complicated right now because you have a spatial aspect to task scheduling in this case. And also you have many resources. I wanted to cover this because this gives you an overall perspective of a lot of resources at the same time. And I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but uh, let me give you uh, the mechanism that this paper devises. And it, it, pr it provides a very sophisticated mechanism in the end. It's a combination of multiple things, basically. So the first idea is really to cluster applications to pieces of the network such that there is no communication across different parts of the network. Now, this is, this is essentially partitioning, right? It's spatial partitioning of the network, such that this application that's mapped on this spatial partition or spatial cluster cannot access this part. Basically, its data is mapped into the cache uh, banks that are here. Its data is mapped into the memory controller that's here. It doesn't have access to it here. Same for this application. Now, this is good because it actually leads to multiple things. It improves the locality of this application, which is good. It doesn't need to go to or go all the way over here to get its data. It reduces the communication distance. It also reduces interference between these applications, clearly, right? Anytime you partition, you reduce interference. The additional aspect over here is it reduces the communication distance. Of course, there are downsides. Anytime you spatially partition, you cannot utilize something over here, right? So there's a downside as well, as we've seen 
with the Zurich airport many times. I think that's my favorite example from now on until they fix it. Maybe I need to find a new example after they fix it. <laughs> I have a feeling they won't fix it for a while. Okay, uh, so this is one example. Uh, well basically, this is one way of actually getting rid of a lot of interference plus uh, uh, reducing communication. Okay, then the next question is, of course, uh, how do you, uh, as always, load balance is a problem, right? You don't want an application, uh, you don't want to spatially partition a network like this and have applications that are extremely light just over here uh, because you, you, have, you don't have a good load balance, perhaps. So we do some load balancing over here to maximize the bandwidth utilization. But perfect load balancing is not that great uh, for interference. So there's always a uh, tension between load balancing and uh, interference or isolation, right? And that's, that's present in the Zurich Airport example, right? You want, if you want to get iso isolation, uh, you, you want to really pr protect these applications that are relatively light, let's say. They don't access memory a lot. You want to protect them because they can make progress very fast uh, in their course. Uh, and you want to protect them from these heavy applications uh, that do not that access memory a lot. Uh, that gives them fast progress, but that actually uh, causes load imbalance because now these applications are not accessing memory, this memory controller or these shared banks a lot. So the load is relatively light over here, whereas the load is very heavy on these other parts where you map the heavy applications. Right? So you need to be careful. And I don't think there is a really perfect solution to this problem. There's, all, there's a fundamental tension between load balance and isolation in general. Okay, and this paper develops some mechanisms to heuristics, let's say, to uh, provide some isolation to these applications that can make a lot of progress if they're not interfered with. But you also need to keep the load balance account because you don't want to really overbalance the system uh, over here uh, such that uh, you're, you're extremely bandwidth limited on these clusters. And then the, uh, the paper actually proposes some other mechanism to map the applications closer uh, applications that need the memory controller a lot closer to the memory controller to improve the bandwidth utilization. You can read the paper uh, for more detail. Basically, this, uh, this basically partitions the network between applications to reduce latency and uh, reduce interference. This tries to provide load balance. This tries to provide isolation to minimize interference and maximize throughput. And in the end, this tries to answer the question of where should applications be mapped in a different cluster, in, in a, within a cluster with respect to uh, how close they are to the memory controllers to maximize the throughput. And these, I think these consider a lot of different aspects. There's also one more aspect that's not depicted over here, which we discussed yesterday. Whenever you partition uh, memory controllers, you have a partitioning problem with memory also. So you need to consider page replacement as well. And this paper proposed a uh, change to the uh, regular page replacement algorithms of the operating system to make sure that you can actually uh, you, you actually reduce the page faults in the system. I'm not going to go over that, but you can read the paper for more detail. So let's take a look at this in a bit more detail. I think I've already said this. What's the benefit of clustering as opposed to uh, potentially generating traffic across the entire distributed system, uh, which may lead to inefficient data mapping uh, across memory and caches? You basically restrict an application's reach. And this improves the locality of the application because you don't need to go far away and you're actually restricted to a fraction of the network. And uh, it also reduces the interference between applications. I've already said this, so I'm not going to go over this uh, a lot more. I'm not going to go over the other mechanisms, but there, there's a sophisticated description of all of the other mechanisms. Now let's take a look at the benefits of uh, some of this. So this is, there's actually uh, a lot of experiments that are done. Yes, please. What's the thing that's so uh, that's a good, a good point. Clustering basically says you divide the network into four, uh, in the sense that it, it's, it's, it provides you some isolation. But uh, the, the, what, what we mean specifically by the isolation over here is you isolate, uh, you take into account the application properties. Here you can do it without taking into account application properties, right? You say basically, I have four network clusters and I randomly assign applications to those clusters. That improves the locality and reduces interference to begin with, but that's not application aware. This isolation has a particular uh, connotation associated in the paper, basically it's application aware isolation. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at some of the results over here because this clustering is actually very powerful. We did a lot of experiments with many, many workloads. 
and I'm going to show you some examples compared to a baseline. I, I believe that baseline mapping was randomly mapping applications across memory controllers. We also looked at some other mapping mechanisms uh, that are in the paper. Uh, and this shows uh, the overall load the applications exert onto the network. This is overall aggregate MPKI, misses per kilo instruction, in the L2 cache is 500, for example. And as you go from left to right, uh, and this is average across many applications, these are applications that exert a lot of pressure uh, on the system. Aggregate MPKI is 2000. Now this is baseline. Uh, let's assume the performance is normalized to one. If you do just clustering, you get significant performance improvement, as you can see, right? Especially in these applications that exert a lot of pressure on the network. That's more than 10%. Uh, and clustering by itself buys you a lot of performance, basically, which is interesting, right? Even, if, even without being application aware. And more performance comes as you increase, uh, as, the, as the intensity of the application increases. And on top of this, if you actually use all of the other mechanisms, the performance, you get some more performance improvement. But you can see that the clustering is the biggest chunk. Uh, but so by partitioning the network, you actually get a lot of performance improvements. I think this, this is actually interesting uh, because this, this says that you have a huge system. You'd better partition the application on this huge system as opposed to distributing everything everywhere. That's the idea. Okay, so let's see if we have some more over here. And you can read the results over here. The, there's one more benefit over here which we uh, wanted to achieve in this work, and that, that is really reducing power consumption. So all of these mechanisms are actually good for power consumption as well. Why? Because if you cluster, you're reducing the communication distance of an application. All applications are actually communicating uh, 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 for shorter distances right, right now. And you can see that that clustering itself leads to a significant reduction in network power. That's the network power consumption that we have in the system. And that's quite significant. You can see, I, I think that's about 35% or so, right? Maybe 30%. And on top of this, other mechanisms actually reduce the network power as well. For example, isolation reduces network power by, again, restricting uh, the interference between different applications. Because whenever you interfere uh, uh, between two requests, one of them gets delayed and you keep consuming more network power. Okay, you can see that network power gets affected even more over here. And again, I'm not going to go through this more. Uh, on top of this, if you actually employ the page fault uh, um, handling policies uh, that, that are proposed over here, such that the page fault, uh, such that the page replacement is now aware of clustering and aware of application properties, then you get even more performance improvements. Because you can now decide which pages to replace from which memory controller, as opposed to randomly, or you, as opposed to using a baseline algorithm that's not aware of this clustering itself. Okay, any questions? Okay. Okay, let me give you another example of this one. This is uh, actually thread scheduling is very powerful, I think. People employ this in uh, data centers also. I'll give you a, a higher level example very briefly uh, right now. So, whenever you have a data center or a compute cluster, you have a lot of jobs and you need to schedule threads. Now you have even more freedom at this point, right? You can somehow figure out which applications go well with each other, and over time you can collect data, you can learn, and you can decide which applications go well or go badly with each other, and you can decide to schedule them. Uh, and people actually try to do that a lot, uh, especially if they're running uh, the same sort of application over and over and over uh, many times uh, in the life of a data center. For example, you can profile the characteristics of an application in 100 runs, and you can use it for the next million rounds or so, right? Assuming that those characteristics are stable over time. Uh, of course, you need to be careful in terms of what happens if you have different inputs to the application. Does that change the behavior of the application? But you can learn that if you have lots of data points in a data center. For example, when you're running Gmail, there are lots of threads that are generated by millions of users around the world, right? And these are running on your data center. You can you can collect a lot of information as to the properties of the different threads, potentially different users also, but that's a bit higher overhead, clearly. Uh, and then you can decide how to schedule Gmail threads in your data center to maximize your performance and utilization. Gmail is, of course, just one example that's probably not as uh, important for, for, the, for the company, but there may be other important applications, right? If, you have, if you're doing inference, for example, uh, on the network or training on the network, you can you can collect information about the applications that you're running 
across many, many instances. Okay. Uh, okay, let me uh, uh, give you an example of uh, scheduling. And this is some work that we've done. Uh, some of this is actually employed by uh, the distributed uh, scheduling mechanisms that are employed in VMware systems, for example. But you know, whenever you're doing virtual, uh, it doesn't matter if it's virtualized or not, but whenever you're doing some scheduling, let's assume that it's virtualized over here, uh, you, you have the task of uh, placing the virtual machines on different hosts in a data center. And in this case, basically, we have two hosts, each have two cores. The question is, how do you dynamically schedule the virtual machines you have onto these hosts? And these are usually called distributed resource management policies because they are done at the data center level, not just with two machines. Two machines is a simple example, clearly. Uh, and when we actually are doing this work, uh, a lot of the metrics that were considered uh, in these distributed resource management schedulers were operating system level metrics. Basically, the operating system or the scheduler looks at the CPU utilization memory capacity demand uh, uh, that, that you have for the virtual machine as well as that is available on the host, right? CPU uh, as well as the memory capacity that's available on the host. And these policies essentially try to allocate virtual machines to hosts such that these memory capacity and CPU utilization is maximally utilized, let's say. So let me give you an example over here. You map uh, uh, virtual machines to different cores such that you maximize the CPU utilization that you have over here as well as the maximize the memory capacity. So this is an example uh, that uh, depicts a virtual machine uh, as a box and the height of the box uh, shows the CPU demand and the length of the box shows the memory capacity demand. You can think of this as bin packing, right? Each machine has some capacity in terms of CPU power as well as memory capacity and you try to uh, map virtual machines uh, it, uh, using their uh, CPU, uh, CPU demand and memory capacity demand, and you try to maximize the CPU power and the max memory capacity power uh, or memory capacity of each machine by doing this bin packing nicely. It's actually a lot of bin packing algorithms if you think about it. You're really trying to maximally utilize memory capacity and CPU of each host. So this is one example. Clearly, if you have the four applications, four virtual machines that I showed you, you, you could do something like this. This essentially tries to balance uh, all of those machines as you can see. Okay, well, of course the question is this is a good thing to do, right? So if you do something like this, you're not really taking into account what's happening in the memory bandwidth, for example, right? You're just looking at how much memory capacity does this virtual machine demand and how much CPU uh, power does this virtual machine demand. It, does, it, has, it says nothing about how much cache or how much DRAM uh, bandwidth does this virtual machine demand. So it may make up, end up making not so good decisions if these virtual machines interact really badly with each other over here, as opposed to, uh, you, you may get a better schedule if you, if you actually consider those metrics. I'll give you an example of this. Okay, that's my architecture level interference that basically you're very familiar with by now. Virtual machines within a host actually compete for shared cache capacity and shared memory bandwidth, as you can see. But operating system level metrics cannot actually capture that microarchitecture level interference, clear. I already said this, so the answer is, no, they cannot. Uh, let me give you an example. This is an example from real machines, for example. Uh, essentially, you have two virtual machines. These are the CPU utilizations that are relatively similar. These are the memory capacities that are relatively similar also. And these are the applications that we use, Stream and Gromax. Uh, if you actually have uh, different instances, two different instances uh, of each of these virtual machines, one way of mapping them to maximize uh, utilization using operating system level metrics could be this one, right? This is a very valid way of ma mapping. Because you want to really uh, get the bin packing nicely such that the bin, uh, bin packing looks similar across these different machines. But this may not be good because once you start taking a look at microarchitecture level metrics, you may realize that this application is very cache unfriendly and it consumes a lot of memory bandwidth. So you can see that, and whereas this application almost always sits in the cache and its memory bandwidth demand is much lower. So if you actually do the mapping without being aware of what's going on at the microarchitecture level, this is actually a pretty bad mapping. Right? Why? Now you map two very intensive applications together on the same virtual machine and they contend with each other in, in, the, in the memory bandwidth. As a result, probably they get slowed down significantly by themselves. Actually, I'll show you results about that. 
this is actually, this is not uh, even slowdown metrics, these are actually IPC throughput results. Uh, this is, uh, if, if you actually do the mapping this way, this is the overall instructions per cycle throughput. Okay. But if you actually are aware of this interference, of this memory bandwidth demand of the applications, probably a better mapping would be to actually swap these virtual machines, right? Put the heavy application and the light application together this way, such that you get a much better utilization over here. And maybe you actually reduce the interference that way. In this case, we were not actually as worried about the interference over here. But if you actually do this, you can see that your throughput improves significantly. So it's a much better mapping mechanism. It's actually 49%, which is quite significant, uh, even within, with just two machines. Okay. okay. And this is based on the presentation in the paper, as you can see. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in this case, clearly, we're not considering interference as much. Our goal is actually throughput. Uh, but throughput is Im improved by actually reducing uh, very heavy, uh, heavy applications uh, running together, uh, reducing the probability of having very heavy applications running together on the same host. Now, of course, the next step over here is how do you actually now provide interference control as well? Uh, I believe it's, uh, you, you need microarchitecture techniques to actually do that really well. Uh, of course, you need to be supported by the system software a little bit, but all of the techniques that we discussed in the last few lectures apply over here also. Okay, any questions on this? So this is just one real example uh, of the microarchitecture level interference. So, uh, and then the next step is, of course, how do you actually take this into account? Uh, and then you can read the paper for more detail. Basically, somehow, you need to monitor and detect these microarchitecture level metrics, shared resource interference, uh, and the memory bandwidth demand and memory cache demand. And in this uh, particular work, the key idea is to balance microarchitecture level resource usage across the cluster, across different machines, essentially. The hope is that that minimizes the interference uh, for, for some definition of interference, clearly. Because here, you have a lot of interference between two different applications. If you go back over here, clearly you have a lot of interference, and you have a lot of imbalance. The goal here really is to balance the microarchitecture level of resource usage across different machines. And that leads to significant throughput improvement. Okay. And then, of course, you need to put that into a real uh, controller. And this controller is actually a software level controller. It's, a, it's essentially a scheduler, workload scheduler that you have in the data center. Uh, you need to add, uh, clearly, microarchitecture level awareness uh, and um, mechanisms to actually profile the applications when they're running uh, and what in terms of what kind of cache resource and memory bandwidth resources they demand. And clearly when the applications change behavior, you somehow need to detect that and you need to do the migration across different virtual machines. That's already there actually for different reasons. Uh, people actually do that. Uh, uh, but we need to do it uh, in a microarchitecture aware manner. I will not go into the details of these, but if you're interested, you can read the paper for more detail. So actually, the existing uh, techniques that are employed in virtualized clusters are now much more sophisticated than this. You can see that this work is almost five years old. Existing techniques that are uh, used in, for example, VMware distributed resource managers are much more sophisticated currently. But we will not go into detail. But that's an example of thread scheduling in the end. You will need to consider interference at the thread scheduling level. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this. Uh, thread scheduling is another way of handling interference. And essentially, this is another way of eliminating or minimizing interference. Right? At, the pri uh, at the prioritization or memory request scheduling level, you're given some applications. You cannot change them. But here, you can change which applications run together. As a result, you have a lot of control. You can eliminate or minimize interference by scheduling symbiotic applications together. Whereas you don't have this choice at the memory scheduler or cache level, clearly. Uh, basically, at the memory scheduler or cache or resource level, you're just managing the interference. That's true for source throttling as well. Right? Data mapping is kind of interesting. You're given some threads, you map the data separately. So you can actually also eliminate and minimize interference that way. Uh, but you cannot change the threads. So uh, clearly, doing this is less intrusive the hardware. Again, this is an this another, that's why this is another example of the dumb resources approach. You can keep all of your resources dumb 
and you can try to manage the interference at the, uh, at the threat scheduling level. As I said, you could do it, but it's not the best result in the end. The best result is when you combine threat scheduling with uh, other mechanisms. Uh, okay, so what are the disadvantages and limitations? These are heavy-handed solutions in general. If the threads actually, uh, mis I don't want to call misbehave, but ch they change behavior, now you have a high overhead uh, to actually migrate the threads. Whereas if the threats change behavior in your memory controller, you just change the scheduling policy. Your right? scheduling policy can adapt to it. Right? You don't change the scheduling policy, but you can, your scheduling policy can adapt to that behavior change. Those are, those, uh, that adaptation is much faster, whereas adaptation through thread migration is much slower because you need to migrate the threads. You probably need to migrate the data associated with the thread also, right? As a result, actually, uh, People are interested in migration for various reasons. This is one of the reasons, performance. But reliability is another reason, right? If one of the machines goes down, for example, what happens to the data of that thread? You may want to migrate it right away. Or you may want to migrate it early on, right? Or you may want to migrate it periodically so that you actually don't lose what you're doing uh, for a long time. And that happens in a lot of data centers to uh, especially for critical applications, clearly. Maybe not, not so critical applications, you don't care. But critical applications, people actually do that. And that is a lot of cost, and people try to reduce the cost of migration uh, significantly. Here, actually, uh, per, uh, fast interconnects are very helpful, clearly, across different machines. But also, persistent memory is very helpful. We're going to talk about emerging memory technologies in the next part of the course. If you actually have persistent memory in a machine, and if you can actually uh, communicate the persistent data relatively quickly once in a while across different machines, you can get, get a much more reliable system uh, that way. Whereas if you need to actually write your data to a very slow disk, and then you, change, you, you migrate the data from there uh, to somewhere else, it takes a long time. So your critical path of data migration actually goes through uh, how fast you can access your persistent data in general. Okay. So, okay, this, this also has a limitation. This doesn't work well if all threads are similar and they interfere with each other. Then you don't have much choice. All threads look alike, and what do you do, right? Not much. <laughs> so these mechanisms are actually uh, very beneficial if you have a lot of heterogeneity in the threads. Okay, any questions? Now I'm going to summarize uh, the wrap up that we have, or quality of service. So let me summarize. We've, we've spent two plus uh, some lectures on memory interference and quality of service. I think it's a really important topic. It's going to be, become even more important going into the future because we really want more predictable systems in the end. And also, this, this um, clearly memory interference and quality of service affects not just predictability but also performance as you've seen and also power. If you really want to improve performance, power, and predictability at the same time, you really want to do a good job in managing interference that you have in the system. And, and as we discussed when we started with these lectures, is not having shared resources is not an option. right? Because if you don't have shared resources, you have a lot of inefficiency to begin with. And your performance, if you, if you think about the performance that you get in terms of the resources that you put in, not having shared resources actually is a is usually a bad trade-off because you need to put in a lot of resources to run a lot of applications because you're not sharing resources between them. So you can argue that you can always over-provision, but over-provisioning is actually not good for performance power, even though it may eliminate interference in the end. Uh, okay, so these are the four techniques that we discussed, prioritization or request scheduling, uh, data mapping, uh, core throttling, source throttling, and application and thread scheduling. And clearly these are different levels. But they all serve the same purpose, to reduce or, uh, and control interference. I believe the best is to combine all, and we've seen some examples of combining multiple different things. Uh, the question is, how would you do that? Uh, there are a lot of heuristics that you can use, clearly, and we've given some examples, but there's a lot more work to be done in this area to really understand the problem. And the problem is actually at multi-level, and it becomes more complex if you have bigger and bigger systems. As I've shown you with the distributed network on chip-based system earlier, uh, when we discussed uh, clustering, for example. Okay, I'll leave you with that question over there. Let me summarize it a different way also. We talked about two different approaches to memory quality of service. One is smart resource and the other is dumb resources. And this is also very fundamental, basically. Smart resources, an example is quality of service over memory scheduling. Dumb resources, an example is source throttling, channel partitioning, and thread scheduling. 
And both approaches are actually individually effective in reducing interference, but there's no single best approach for all workloads. Sometimes the, making the resources smart works better, sometimes making the, uh, keeping the resources dumb but doing something else in the periphery works better. I think the best is really to combine all the, uh, the, the different approaches in an intelligent way. And we've also seen several techniques like scheduling, throttling, and partitioning. And again, all approaches are effective in reducing interference, and they can be applied at different levels also, hardware versus software. But again, there's no single best technique for all workloads. Different workloads benefit differently from these different techniques. And again, I think combined approaches and techniques are the most powerful in the end. Even though they add more complexity to the system, that complexity may be useful, uh, as long as you can manage the complexity. But as we discussed, managing that complexity is not also easy. And this is, this is why I think more work needs to be done in terms of how to manage this complexity with less human-driven approaches, more data-driven and machine-driven approaches. OK, so that's my summary. Basically, if you have quality of service on aware memory, you get an uncontrollable, unpredictable system. Providing quality of service awareness improves performance, predictability, fairness, and utilization of the memory system, including power consumption. And we discussed many new techniques to minimize memory interference, provide predictable performance, and I believe many new research ideas are needed for integrated techniques. And also closing the interaction with the software. We didn't talk about interaction with the software a lot, although it was always sprinkled around, right? How do you incorporate thread priorities? How does the software provide different goals in terms of throughput, fairness, or application performance? But there's a lot of interaction with the software that uh, needs to happen as well. Okay, so what we did not cover, and we're, not, we're probably not going to cover also, uh, for example, uh, one thing we ignored is prefetches, right? What happens to prefetches? We, we talked about memory scheduling. We assume that all the requests are kind of the same in terms of their demands, right? Actually, we didn't even talk about reads versus writes, which is another thing, right? That's, that also changes the behavior. So actually, the problem is even more complicated as you go deeper, as well as as you go broader. Prefetches are interesting, and we briefly discussed that, how do you actually handle the prefetches? Uh, sometimes prefetches, as I mentioned earlier, I think, in a lecture, sometimes prefetches are as important as demands. Because that prefetch is going to save you a demand, and it's accurate. And if you actually delay it, it's not going to save you the demand anymore. So you better not delay it. If you have that information, then you need to consider prefetches similar to demands. But if you are confident that the prefetch is not going to be useful, or if you have low confidence that it's going to be useful, maybe you treat it differently. So I think you need to treat prefetches intelligently, and there's some work in this area also. Co-design across the resource is something we didn't cover also. Uh, this we, I kind of alluded to it, basically. If you have smart resource, let's say a smart cache, smart memory controller, smart interconnect, if these are not coordinated with each other, they may actually go against each other. What you do in each of these resources can go against each other. And we've seen this in the fairness via source throttling work. I mentioned that briefly. But if you actually co-design your resources such that the policy that you employ in your last level cache, for example, is coordinated with the policies that you employ in your memory controller, you can get much better efficiency. I'll give you one example. Uh, for example, uh, you may have a row that's open in your memory controller, uh, in, your, in one of the banks in your memory controller. Clearly, an access to an open row is much faster. And your cache is now trying to decide what to evict at this point. There's some, there's some space that's needed by demanding your cache. And the cache is a choice to evict uh, a cache block A versus B. And it turns out cache block A is going to an open row in your memory controller. And B is not going to an open row. Which one would you choose? Any guesses? I think I set up the question nicely so that you have no choice but to answer A. <laughs> Basically, uh, the realization is that if you evict the cache block that's going to an open, uh, open row in the memory controller, you can exploit the robot for locality in the memory controller. I think that's a very nice idea, actually. It's called uh, DM, or last level cache right back. Essentially, when you want to evict something from your cache, maybe you should inspect what's going on in your memory controller and evict stuff that your memory controller can handle nicely and quickly, efficiently, as opposed to putting more burden to your memory controller. If you, if you start evicting uh, cache blocks that, uh, that essentially go to random rows, you're putting a lot of burden to your memory controller. Right? Now your memory controller needs to open and close all of those rows to write back those cache blocks. But if you have the option 
the evict cache blocks that all go to the same row, you basically create a nice stream to your memory control and you write back all of those cache blocks very quickly into your memory. This improves your memory bandwidth utilization significantly, actually. Actually, there are several results suggest that. I can point you to papers. Uh, this also reduces the queuing delays in the memory controller. It also reduces the right to read switching penalties that you have, it turns out, because whenever you open a row in the memory controller, you're getting rid of a lot of the writebacks that happen to that row. Uh, and you're evicting them quickly, as opposed to doing one of the writebacks to that row once, and then five seconds later, another write back to that row, and then five seconds later, another write back to that row. That leads to a lot of write to read switching penalties in the memory controller. So this is one example of a, a, a very good example of how to design a cache together with a memory controller. Of course, then the question is how do you do it, right? How do you do it efficiently? Of course, this, the, even this introduces a trade-off, right? If you do this, uh, now you're evicting potentially some cache blocks early. Because you may not be evicting that cache block that goes to the row, because you may think that it's going to be reused soon, right? So you may actually induce some additional cachenesses. Now you need to do an empirical study to see uh, what do you do? When do you do this eviction and when do you not do this eviction that's aware of the memory controller? So I find this sort of idea fascinating. This is an example of uh, cache to uh, memory controller co-design. You've actually seen an example of uh, core and memory controller co-design kind of loosely, right? Parallelism over batch scheduling is loosely an example of that, right? Memory controller kind of anticipates requests coming from a core that's in parallel and it wants to service them in parallel. It's kind of aware of the parallelism that's generated by the cores. So that's a loose example of core and memory controller co-design. I think if you uh, actually uh, look at these different optimizations that happen across the hierarchy, you can get a lot more efficiency out of the system. Of course, as, as a researcher, it's nice to do, th do these things. If you're interested in, for example, uh, the DRM or last level cache write back paper, uh, you can read that. We, we have a technical report on this in 2010. I think I actually pointed that out uh, earlier. IBM actually did a very similar paper uh, concurrently with us. They called it the virtual right queue. And they published in ISCA 2011. We were a little bit late, so we were not able to publish it in a top conference. Ours is a technical report in the end. But it's a very similar idea uh, that happened at the same time. Uh, but as a researcher, I think these are actually really nice to investigate. Uh, there are some technical challenges and mindset challenges that happen in industry. So if you go to industry, you will see that there are people who work on memory controllers, and there are people who work on caches, and there are people who work on cores. And they usually don't talk to each other much. As a result, I do my thing on my core, somebody else does their thing in their cache, and somebody else does their thing in their memory controller, and they may all contradict each other. In the end, the system you get is not very good. Right? <laughs> Some of you who have worked in industry are thinking right now, maybe. <laughs> So this is true. This is, I think, uh, some, uh, and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the industry that realizes that this is not good, actually, they do really well. They can optimize across the stack and across their designs. And I think it's really important to realize that like, in, the, in the future, if you may form your own companies, don't get into the situation where you have silos that don't communicate with each other because you're losing a lot of efficiency that way. Okay, if you don't learn anything in this course, maybe that's one thing that to learn. <laughs> Communication is really important in the end. Okay, so what else did we uh, not talk about? We didn't talk about caches, cache interference management, even though there, it's really important and there's a lot of research in that area. Like how do you partition your caches? How do you provide quality of service to different applications? We just don't have time at this point. We may talk about that in the future. Let's see. Uh, but clearly you see that there are issues over there, right? If you have a shared cache, an application that's extremely intensive, an application that's streaming through a lot of data can destroy the performance of an application that has very good locality and a very small amount of data. Right? If you don't manage your cache nicely, if you use LRU-based management, it's not very good basically in the end. You need to somehow manage your cache nicely. Uh, similar to the techniques that we discussed for memory scheduling, but of course the techniques need to be uh, customized to the caches. Interconnects are also important. Again, I didn't talk about that. Uh, and we didn't cover interconnects, but when we get to interconnects, we're going to talk a little bit about this also. But I'm giving you a glimpse of it when we talked about this distributed uh, shared caches and distributed memory controllers across the chip. Right to read scheduling, I think I mentioned this briefly. Uh, how do you reduce interference with different DRM designs? Uh, there's work in this area also. 
uh, that I'm not going to talk about right now, multi-ported DMs, for example. And I think going forward, there's a lot of interference issues in near memory, in memory processing also. This is a generalization. Uh, this is actually a special case of accelerators. If you have lots of accelerators in the system that are accessing memory, clearly you have a bigger quality of service from. But if you also have an accelerator next to memory or inside your memory, you have an even bigger quality of service problem, right? This accelerator actually needs to operate on the data inside the memory over there. But if some other processor needs to access the data at the same time, maybe not the same data, but some other data that's in the same bank. Now you have a quality of service problem that's bigger. And this accelerator uh, that's near memory has probably more opportunity to access memory, right? Because it's much closer. So you need to be very careful in terms of how you handle quality of service. And as far as I know, there are not a lot of works that Actually, there's no work that has tackled this interference problem in, in memory processing engines. So clearly there's a lot more, but I don't have time. Uh, okay, so I think uh, these are some key uh, topics. Uh, as we discussed, the problem is getting worse, uh, and we need more quality of service techniques, especially for heterogeneous SOC systems. Essentially, I will call this complex systems. Even though we don't know how to solve the problem perfectly in simple systems, meaning simple meaning, let's say, four cores, even that, we don't have an extremely good solution, meaning uh, like a theoretically optimal solution, let's say. We have to deal with complex systems. We have no other choice, right? Because these systems are there, and you need to design mechanisms for these. And I think uh, looking at these systems is really important, and it has to be done. Uh, combination of memory, quality of service, and performance techniques, we've already discussed that. How do you combine these different techniques? I think that's also really important to do. And I think this is, uh, as I mentioned many times, uh, you really need some sort of machine learning to aid you. Because having worked on these topics for almost 15 years now, actually, uh, I, I strongly believe that uh, humans have limited power to actually solve these problems. <laughs> it's better if we actually uh, understand how we can use machine learning approaches or data-driven approaches uh, to actually solve these problems in a, in a different level. Humans can provide some insight to guide those approaches, perhaps, but we cannot deal with all of the different complexities of different techniques, uh, different types of things that are going on in the system, and many, many different constraints. In the end, if you think about the state space, it's huge. But if you uh, also look at, look, at, look at the things you consider, it's really many, many dimensions. It's just too hard for humans. I don't, I don't know of any, uh, any human who can think in a many dimensional space, right? We have difficulty optimizing even a single metric, right? But now you need to optimize, let's say, five or six metrics. And your state space is extremely large. OK, on top of this, I think we'll need to uh, build real prototypes. Uh, and I, I really believe that uh, we should really be doing a lot of work on this sort of infrastructure that are FPGA-based. Uh, and if you're interested, you can talk to me about it. OK, I think that's, that's my wrap up, my quick wrap up for the quality of service part. Any questions? Maybe it was not that quick. Since it still took almost an hour. But hopefully this shows you the importance of the problem. I'll wait for some questions and then we'll take a break. OK, I guess there are no questions. So, so let's take a break until uh, 2.25. And then we'll start with emerging memory technologies.